Hi, this is Guy Wallace with another video in my series, Adventures in Performance-Based Training and Development, with your host, me, Guy Wallace. Note that I've also subtitled this series, The Insomnia Solution, but not for my insomnia, but for yours. I'm just kidding. In this video, we're going to review or overview another of my models and methods of impact, lesson maps, and an associated document, lesson specifications, but we're really going to focus on the lesson maps. Now, I created these first back in 1990 for a project that I had with Illinois Bell, and it was on labor relations for first-line supervisors. Illinois Bell was a client of mine at that time. I'd done a couple of curriculum architecture design projects, and in those where I'm doing a uh, training and development path and planning guides based on the performance requirements of the jobs, the uh, enabling knowledge and skills that are required, and existing training that the client might already have in its possession. Uh, so they were familiar with my facilitated group process approach for that, and they were kind of expecting that I was going to be doing that at the ADDIE level, what I call MCD, Modular Curriculum Design, or excuse me, Development and Acquisition. And I had been meaning to do this, but here was an uh, opportunity for me to do this on a client project. So I crafted uh, an initial look at what is called the lesson map. Now this view that I'm showing you now is the current view and the view that I've been using since probably 1991. And looking at uh, past blog posts uh, for the graphics that I intended to use for this video, I've seen that I've too often written that I created all of this back in 1991. So I had to go back to the design document that I had from that project and yes it is indeed 90. 1990 is when I created this format and uh, I wrote about this in my company's newsletter in the fall of 1993 and that was the first publication, the first public announcement. If you hadn't been a client you would have never seen this before. Uh, there were a couple of projects I did after the Illinois Bell project um, but it wouldn't have been widely known and, and you, it wouldn't have really been widely known because our newsletter only went out to our uh, current clients and past clients and uh, other friends that in, were in the business. But uh, so this was created in 1990. Now this um, this next graphic is a beta version, if you will, for the event map, which is part of my MCD design at three levels uh, uh, tools, a way to capture and report out the data. Um, so that this is what the uh, this course was all about, and the lesson map, uh, which was originally called the lesson specification sheet in this first use of this um, is also shown right now. Um, I concluded that really what I really wanted was to have two uh, equivalent versions of my design at, at especially at this level at the lesson map level. So I had the lesson map of instructional activities. Uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit. And then there was a lesson specification in my current methodology set and the map was to be a bit more visual and it was to help clients look at the flow of content you know what topic or task were we going to be focused on and then what would that lead to and what would that lead to so that they could assess whether or not that seemed appropriate that flow that sequence of content um, and then I have the specification sheet that's the equivalent or parallel with the map but it's got data uh, and is not it doesn't show the flow as well. It does show the flow, but it's it's not as uh, intuitively obvious in terms of you know what's the flow? How many minutes are you going to spend on this? Then that? Then the next thing? Um, and I needed a place to park all of the stinking details, if you will, that I didn't want to cloud the lesson map. Um, we have issues in our field with we cause too much cognitive load in our instruction, in our training, in our learning, and I didn't want to do that in the design phase, so I thought I wanted to have this map be something that people could perform a sniff test, if you will, that's what it was called back in the day, a uh, sniff test to see if this smelled funny or right or whatever, but it would, it would allow the clients to scan this and make an instant judgment as to whether or not this seemed reasonable. Then the specification sheet 
that parallel the map gave additional details and they, they could you know say okay so what's is this one little thing going to be covered I don't see it on your map oh here it is on the specification sheet which went to a little bit more granularity in describing the content the flow uh, the timing and all the rest of that. So the two had to work in unison and what I created when I met with the design teams is I created the lesson map and then after the design team meeting I created the specification and folded in all the additional details that I had from the analysis data that I didn't want to really cloud up that lesson map format. But anyway so this was the original version of this again from 1990. Now these formats were intended to be used on flip chart size paper as a central focus for a design team meeting. Now in my methodology the design team are members of the analysis team with no new players. Uh, often the entire analysis team became a design team although I would often prefer to work with a smaller group when I was doing design than I was okay with doing when I was doing the analysis level efforts. Uh, but sometimes the analysis data is generated and then it's reviewed by the project steering team and we're given approval, yeah that's good, or here's some tweaks, now we're happy, go ahead and design with this. And But other times uh, if the client was in a particular hurry we would combine the analysis and design team efforts, especially for content that was going to be of shorter duration ultimately. And of course you can use the same methodology to produce a whole slew of what today is called micro learning. Um, we didn't use that kind of language, we called it chunking, we made sure it was the right size, but back, back in the uh, 80s and 90s the technology wasn't available to us to uh, produce and distribute much shorter versions of content. It just didn't make sense, so you tended to load more things into an instructional package, if you will. And, uh, you know, nowadays that's not necessary because we can send a text message with some of the content or we can provide you with a short, you know, 60 second or less or more video and convey the content that's necessary as long as that's part of an overall instructional design strategy. Um, but uh, so as many ISDers nowadays are talking about, you know, design thinking and agile approaches and all of that. I've been doing this since 1982 using teams of people, getting the voice of the master performers, the voice of su other subject matter experts, the voice of supervisors and managers, and the voice sometimes of novice performers in the analysis efforts and in the design efforts. And then because I use a project steering team for gate review meetings, so after I've a major milestone, once I've done the analysis I'll check in with them, review that, get their approvals or questions or challenges or revisions and then move on to design and then do the same thing at the end of the design phase and then before I move into development uh, because I don't believe in um, iterations that were unnecessary. There's enough iterations already without us being somewhat sloppy in our work and just you know being okay with the fact that well we're going to iterate and so because I know that most of my clients hated that because when you're iterating uh, not to plan you know iterating to plan is one thing but iterating uh, outside of the plan uh, in contrast to the plan uh, makes the situation unpredictable. It's not predictable in terms of what's the cycle time, what's the schedule, what are the costs going to be to the client and I know for a fact that very few clients are okay with that kind of operation where you don't really know we'll be done when we're going to be done. You know they do not like they they like to know when you're going to be done with the analysis phase, when you're going to be done with the design phase, when you're going to be done with the development phase, when you're going to go into pilot test and be done with that, and when will this thing be ready for general availability to be released into whatever mechanisms are appropriate for that particular set of content to allow people to access it in a controlled manner, in an open manner, or to be deployed through facilitators, instructors, and the like, whether that's virtual or face-to-face, -face, traditional. So lesson maps are used in my methodology and they closely align with ADDI. MCD is an ADDI level approach, although I don't use just those five boxes, I have six in mind, and it all starts off with project planning and kickoff, and the back end of that is, is different as well. 
So I have three levels of design in my packed processes for training and development, and that is curriculum architecture design at the top, developing learning paths, creating no new training, but just figuring out what do we need, what do we got, what's missing, what are the priorities. How much is it going to cost to put the priorities in place? Okay, and then we drop down into either the MCD level, the ADDI level, to crank out, you know, performance-based instruction. Uh, but sometimes you just need a series of job aids or a bunch of demos or a bunch of performance tests, and there's no need to go through the same steps uh, in that effort as you would in an MCD effort to produce traditional or non-traditional instruction. And that level of my design is IAD, Instructional Activity Development. And I've used this when the client has needed performance tests and no instruction, just the test, please. Or I've had, a, this all started for me when a client asked me, could I produce the demonstrations that are part of this, which you'll see in a little bit, uh, and then come back and then fill in the information and the application exercises later because they had a national sh sales show. This was back in the late 80s. Um, and they wanted to know that it, could I take my design and then produce those demonstrations so they could show them at the national sales show and show the audience this is the training that we're going to be building. Let's take a look at you know what we're going to be training you to do because that's what I believe about demonstrations. Again, I'll come into that a little bit. There are two primary analysis sources for crafting, constructing, lesson maps, and possibly a third, most often a third, uh, if I have my druthers. Um, there, so the two sets of analysis data are the performance data and the enabling knowledge and skill data, and that's all used to feed the lesson map and the lesson mapping process. The performance data includes the ideal performance, but not just blue sky ideal, it's real ideal. So what I use, the facilitated group process, where I assemble a group of minimally master performers, I get them to come to consensus on what are the outputs, what are the key measures, what are the task perform, what are the various roles in task performance, and who's doing what, where are you collaborating with others, where are you doing things on your own, where do you come together and review things and get it reviewed and approved or revised. Um, and that, so that ideal performance is what master performers are doing. And then the question goes to them, so what about the non-master performers? Where are they having issues? And that's a gap analysis. So this is about current state performance and segregating the current state performance into mastery performance and not so mastery. So off the top of the heads, if you will, of the master performers, What's causing other people to not be master performers? What's what are what's inhibiting them? So we also look for well. So what are the typical uh, performance gaps in the first place? You know where are the outputs not meeting the measures? Specifically, what measures? And then what are the probable causes for that? Now we could do root cause analysis if we had all the time in the world, but normally I'm doing this in a two or a three or a four day meeting and I've got a lot to do. So I can't just spend endless amount of time on this. So off the top of the heads of the master performers assembled, what do they think are the typical gaps and the probable causes and which of those probable causes are deficiency in the environment? Nothing to do with the people necessarily, except maybe your boss or other people who are supposed to be getting you the environmental resources that you need to perform. And then what are the deficiencies of knowledge? Where are non-master performers struggling because they just don't know? And what is it perhaps that's a, a deficiency of the individual attributes and values? Perhaps they don't value customer service and that's the problem, or they don't uh, value working with uh, other team members they prefer working on their own or they're physically not capable of performing or psychologically they're not capable of performing or intellectually they're not capable of performing. For example, if you're trying to take concrete thinkers and make strategic planners out of them, you might struggle with that and you probably should have done a different, a better job of selecting people who already thought strategically, conceptually, rather than uh, simply concretely. Anyway, so the performance data is used to feed the lesson mapping process. But before we jump to that, we're using the performance data to systematically derive the enabling knowledge and skills. Now, I have 17 categories 
of enabling knowledge and skills. And I've covered that in a, other, in a, in a video in this series, so I'm not going to go into any depth in that. And it's in the books and things like that that I'll reference at the end of this video. But uh, So we use these 17 categories to systematically look at the performance and tease out, elicit, what are the enabling knowledge and skills in this category? So what are the laws, regulations, and codes must one comply with? What are the tools and equipment? What are the interpersonal skills? And then, you know, all the rest of the categories. And all of that data is captured on knowledge and skill matrices. Again, on a flip chart in the front of the room, in front of everybody, and then posted on the wall for continuous sync referencing that data as we do uh, the other data. Now, most often, if I have my preference, I always gather the, this third set of data to feed the design process. Um, and that is to look at what existing training or learning content already exists in the corporation, in my client's organization, that we can try to reuse as is, or after modification, or no, it's not appropriate. We need to declare that. Here's what we're going to use as is. Here's what we're going to use after we modify it because it's not quite right. And here's what some people might think we're going to use, but no, we're not. And again, I don't want to go into any great detail on that. I talked about that in the, in the earlier video, the video that precedes this in the sequence. Um, so all of that data, again, might be reviewed by a project steering team before we use it in the design. But there's other times when I've just gone from the analysis efforts in one meeting and then slid right into the design process to use that data. And of course, that's a little bit risky, but sometimes that's the business decision that's appropriate and the client gets to make that, not instructional designers. Uh, my three levels of design, where I'm taking all of this analysis data and manipulating it, facilitating it, using it to craft my design, it starts off at the top with an event map of, of lessons. So just like if you were to look at the map of your country, then you're in the United States, we're going to look at the map of the U.S. and we're going to look at what's in there? Well, states. And if you were to look at a state map, then you're going to look at counties or whatever the equivalent term is for that because not everybody calls them counties. So there's three levels of design, the event level, the lesson level, and the instructional activity level. And I take all of that analysis data and uh, the performance data and the knowledge and still data, skill data goes straight into the lesson mapping process and the decisions about what existing content can be reused uh, as is after modification or not at all, uh, but the uh, as is and after modification, that's all captured into the lesson specification. That's part of that stinking details that I don't want to cloud people's uh, thinking as they're scanning the flow of content in the lesson uh, map format. Um, so the the after the lesson uh, uh, lesson map comes the instructional activity specification, and this is an example of what the um, lesson level specification looks like too. It's a it's a series of clusters of data um, organized in a way to to inform the developers as to what to do. So oftentimes my clients don't even really want to look at that. They're satisfied at looking at the lesson map and, and looking at the titles of things and uh, how much time is going to be spent on them, whether it's a demonstration or one application exercise or three application exercises. They get to look at that, question that, challenge that, agree to that, revise that, whatever it is because you know we're working for them. Um, and they may or may not want to look at the at the specification level, but I have that for them in any review process in case they want to look deeper on any one or all of it, uh, any one lesson or all of it. But the instructional activity specification level of my design is really there to guide the instructional development, the developers and to make sure that they understand what their marching orders are post-design, after the design has been approved or revised or, again, whatever. So the maps, again, are used to provide a more visual flow, and the specifications just give a place to park all the extra stinking details that don't seem appropriate to put on a lesson map for cognitive load purposes. It's just not learners or participants in instruction that suffer from cognitive load. It's the people that we ask to review our dense set of data 
analysis, design, etc., and then sign off on it. And uh, it's an impossible task. Here is an example of an event map from that first Illinois Bell project on labor relations for supervisors. And it identified the flow and it identifies that there's 12 chunks and there's an open and a close in that. But uh, so there's 10 chunks of content in here and that's that flow. So my clients can take a look at that and go, okay, that makes sense, but what's in that second or third or fourth box? Or bubble um, and let's scrutinize that and so that's where then the that next format comes in and again this is the earlier format the initial format that was uh, changed in terms of how I labeled it and uh, uh, but the but the three column approach if you can see that uh, is information demonstration and application or that's what it became it's not labeled that in this so again the the analysis data that feeds us our performance analysis data knowledge and skill data that enables that performance, and then any existing training and development assessment data. And you can call these things anything you want. I've just called them the same thing since the early and mid and late 80s. And in order to help others climb the learning curve and the performance curve to be able to do this work, whether they're my staff or my client staff or others, um, I've tended not to change my language too much uh, in order to reduce the confusion that uh, changing labels would cause over the decades. But let's take a look now at how the performance model feeds the lesson map. So when I have the performance data, I'm able to work again with a design team and take the data that I have and confront them and ask them to make decisions on, so given this analysis data, what are the learning objectives? And let's, you know, quickly write them out, not try to polish the language or whatever, but let's just get that out so that we have a focus for this page of the lesson map. What the heck is this trying to do? What are the learning objectives? And my approach to learning objectives is there's two levels. There's terminal learning objectives and there's enabling learning objectives. And the terminal learning objectives could be called performance objectives. This is what you're going to be able to do back out on the job once you get there after this training is over with. Is that clear? And then there's a bunch of enabling uh, knowledge and skills. In order to be able to perform, uh, you're going to have to know things. And so what are they? Now, when I deliver the training later on, for those of you who don't like this notion already, um, I only articulate the performance objectives to the learners, or what I call the participants in, uh, in designed uh, instructional experiences. Um, and I don't need to cloud their minds up and, and cause cognitive overload with them in terms of here's all the enabling knowledge and skills, all the stuff you got to know to be able to do. I'm just focused on what you're going to be able to do. And that's usually satisfactory for my participants in my designed instructional experiences. Um, so once I've got that clear and I can face poll around the room and make sure that everybody is okay with, yeah, that's, that's what this is all about. This chunk is going to teach people how to do that. And yeah, here's the, what they're going to need to be able to know. So that all comes from, again, the performance model data and the enabling knowledge and skill data as we've chunked that out, as we sorted that prior to doing the lesson mapping exercise in my MCD design methods. But that data then, I can use the performance data to look at what are the application exercises, practice with feedback basically, or case studies if that seems to be appropriate. I tend not to go after case studies because I, I know what the tasks and outputs look like. I don't need to do a case study on that. I need to put people in direct instruction with direct application exercises to teach them, make them practice how to do the tasks of a job and to produce some equivalent or exact output just like back in the real world. Um, that's my philosophy on this is to keep everything as authentic as possible. And if what I'm dealing with is too darn complex, I might have to articulate three different levels of application exercises, such as in the example here that I'm showing you. And the first one could be kind of easy peasy. You know, it's it's the job, but the, you know this one is easy. This is this uh, task set and output. This one is easy, and then I can add some more difficulty to it. And then, if necessary, I can give you the application exercise from Hades, 
um, you know, the worst case situation that you might have to confront back out on the job. So, you know, if the job isn't always easy peasy, then an easy exercise doesn't prove anything other than maybe guy can do the easy exercises, but we've not put him through the grist of can he do something that's more difficult? Can he do something that's kind of worst case scenario? And as I'm working with a design team of master performers, this either makes sense to them or it makes no sense at all. And so I use the voice of the master performers to guide me in this, but I'm challenging them. We'll have an easy one, something that's a lot more difficult, and then something that's hellacious. And either that makes sense to them or it doesn't. Um, but that's what the performance model of data does. Then I can ask the question of the design team, should we present the learners, the participants, with a demonstration of what we're going to ask them to do in the application exercise. So I shortcut these, these labels. So do we need a demo before they do the appos? You know, is that going to help them do the application exercise if we show them, hey, learner, this is what you're going to be doing next, so pay attention. Here's a demonstration of authentic performance, and we're going to have you do something exactly the same or similar. We may have made it a little less complex in these application exercises. And again, the voice of the master performers, the voice of other subject matter experts, the voice of supervisors, the voice of novice performers on the design team get to make that decision. I simply facilitate them to confront them with these kinds of decisions using the analysis data and always sticking with the analysis data. So once we've got that done and put on a flip chart in front of the room and everybody gets to see it and question it and see exactly what words did Guy write down on the flip chart and are those acceptable or do we call this something else out here in our real world and et cetera. And, you know, so Illinois Bell, you know, it's just one of 50 states and, and several other territories in the United States. But in Illinois Bell, in the southern part of the state, they use different language for what people in the northern part of the state used. And I found that to be so true that I always am wary of the language and the labels that I capture in my methodologies and then report out because I know or I suspect that there could be different language in use. And it's not just the semantics, it's always the semantics, as one of my colleagues uh, taught me back in the mid-90s. So we use then the, the knowledge and skill data once we've exhausted all the performance data that we have, whether that's a whole bunch or just, you know, one output and, and task set or, you know, 20 outputs and 20 task sets. Uh, as soon as we've got that all on these flip chart pages uh, and gotten the right-hand sides of the lesson maps, if you will, and the top, uh, completed, now we're ready to look at the what are the enabling knowledge and skills and how are we going to uh, use them and sequence them and uh, time them uh, in order to prepare people for the demonstration. And so the yellow boxes now on the slide uh, show you where we have sorted the enabling knowledge and skills. And you know, it could have been one yellow box for every individual knowledge and skills or we could have gone through the knowledge and skills and put three or four of them together because that makes sense to the design team you know then the designer me uh, or somebody else knows that you know that's a likelihood so let's not chunk everything into small tiny bits here when three things really go together and we would teach them you know together we would never really separate them they would always go together and you know there's times when that's true and that when that's not but anyway so you, the, the goal here is to get out what are what from the enabling knowledge and skills data and how we've organized it on the knowledge and skill matrices and we've tied it back to various aspects or segments of performance the areas of performance the outputs and tasks um, and we can then pull out from that here's the data the information that we're going to need to provide so the what info comes before the demo that comes before the appos and does that make sense is that what we need is there any extraneous stuff here is there anything missing and that's the time for the design team to step up and you know plug the gaps or skinny it back down 
Um, then, if I have the data, the existing training and development data, I mean, some I've had some clients that don't have any existing content that seemed appropriate for us to even go look at, so we didn't spend their money to go and do that. But most of the time, clients have existing content. Shareholders have paid for it. Why don't we reuse that if it's appropriate? Uh, otherwise, we're creating derivative content that's out of control and we're increasing our first cost and we're increasing our life cycle cost to maintain all this content when we have inadvertently or deliberately created content that's pretty much the same. And so um, that's just not good business practices. Uh, you know, uh, good stewards of shareholder equity don't operate that way. And so when I talk about that with my project steering team, with my clients, you know, that makes business sense to them that we would reuse what we already have in inventory rather than recreate something else and only discover later on that, oh, that's the same as some other content in some other course. Gee, we should have taken an opportunity to uh, reuse that, but we didn't. So part of my methodology is to make sure I get that in the analysis phase. Uh, that that gets reviewed by the project steering teams most of the time and then that's used to inform the design. Now that content doesn't go into a lesson map but I put little stars on this graphic here to identify where it is we've got something that we might use as is or after modification because that's different and because if it's something that needs to be modified there is a bit of development or redevelopment work that's going to be required. But if we have something that we can use as is, then we're just going to build around it uh, and surround it with the other gap content or the other content that uh, has been modified. So in summary, the uh, performance model data feeds the learning objectives, it feeds the application exercises, the APOs, and it feeds the demo in, on a lesson map and the enabling knowledge and skills feed the information column of the lesson map. And the existing training and development content assessments, they don't make it to the lesson map other than I've shown you with my little stars, but they normally don't. They go into that parallel document, the lesson specification, which is where I capture all the details about uh, here's existing content we're going to reuse. You know, that document also uh, begins to uh, specify more about the exact timing of things, um, uh, etc. So, the, I have a set of questions, kind of my starter questions. Now, when I train people on this methodology, I share with them my questions, but I tell them, Oh, these are my questions and so when you go into the application exercises to prove to me that you got the information got what the demonstration was trying to convey and now you are in an application exercises those are guys questions and you can't use them and that's because I want them to learn to paraphrase and use a different set of questions if uh, one thing I discovered early on is that I can ask a question one way and it doesn't resonate with who I'm asking and so they can't give me the answer I'm looking for and I have to learn how to ask that same question two or three or four or five different ways so that I can find some way to communicate my question to whoever I'm questioning and so that they can you know grab onto that and give me the answer that I'm looking for so you know thinking that you can use a, a stock set of questions and get everything that you need that's faulty thinking and so you have my questions, guys' questions, as a backup, but you better come up with your own. And so as part of the exercises, I force people to figure out what, how they're going to ask that question in the application exercise that's similar to guys' question, but isn't guys' question, because guy is going to be looking over their shoulders as they do this application exercises, and you get no credit for stealing guys' questions and using it. You're going to have to steal it, paraphrase it, make it your own, and if your question doesn't work, then you can default to my question to see if that might work a little bit better for you. But anyway, so I ask questions about the learning objectives and the post-learning performance objectives because I'm always trying to take, you know, well, you got to know this, you got to know that. I'm always trying to take that, so I got to know these things because of what? Because what, what is it that I'm going to be able to do if I know that? 
and get everything oriented to a performance uh, to, to a performance orientation. And when you're dealing with the design team, it's critical because most people think of content. Uh, information, 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 topic, 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 topic. Sometimes they think of tasks. Sometimes, rarely, they think of the outputs as a result of the tasks. But they don't, so they don't have a performance orientation. We have too much of a topic orientation and not a, enough of a task orientation. And that's true of our clients as well. They're used to the education system, which gave them a whole bunch of topics, and then later on you're going to figure out how to apply that in the real world. Hey, isn't that nifty? Uh, I don't like that. That's not very effective. It's not very efficient. Eventually, the learners, the participants will figure it out on the job, but we might have been able to shortcut that and got them to a higher level of pro productivity much quicker. Being effective and efficient is a worthy goal. Um, so that's what I do with the objectives. And once I've got, I'm satisfied as the designer, you know, we're, I'm, we're not designing by committee as I tell these design teams. We're influencing the designer, me, by committee. You're the committee, we call you a design team, but you're here to influence me and to keep me on the straight and narrow path and not going off and doing crazy instructional design things just because I think it's a good idea. I might have good ideas that prove to be good, or I might have good ideas that prove out to be, you know, silly nonsense. No, they don't need a demonstration. The entire target audience knows enough about this here. You just need to tell them and if you really want to, put them in an application exercise guide. But oftentimes, sometimes actually, um, my design team might say, no, they don't even need an application exercise. You just explain it to them uh, given their prior incoming knowledge and skills based on education and experience in the workplace. They don't need it. So a lot of this has to depend on, well, who is the target audience and do we have some people who have that kind of an experience background, that kind of education background, and do we have another segment of our target audience that doesn't have that, which is simply going to cause us to want to create a more modular approach so that the people that don't have the experience can get the training that they need and the people that don't need that training can skip it and that has to do with how we modularize or chunk out our training uh, our learning etc so after we've gotten uh, that down I, uh, the objectives here again we're gonna look at so what are the application exercises or exercise that's necessary and this gives me a chance to talk with my design team about you know the the easy peasy level of application exercise as a starter to get to something that's much more difficult to get to something that's more hellacious the application exercise from Hades sometimes it takes more than three and your design team of hand-picked master performers in my experience, aren't going to be shy about explaining to you whether one is enough, two is necessary, three, four, five, or six is going to be necessary. And even if my client were to be there and argue that that's way too much, that's going to take up way too much time, they're going to go nose to nose, toe to toe with that person and tell them, but that's necessary. Do you want people to actually be able to do this when they're done? Or you just want to pretend about it? And I've witnessed those kinds of confrontations between my client who wanted to direct me not to put in any more application exercises and have master performers come out of their chairs, quite literally, walk over to my client and read them the riot act about how wrong they are. And if that's all that they're going to do, that they're wasting my time and everybody else's time in this room here. And you, if you want us to tell you what's needed, necessary, to take a new person, the trainee, and prepare them for their the world of work that this particular lesson is aimed at. So it's always interesting to, uh, <clears throat> and I find that I need to jump in at some point uh, before uh, fists are thrown around the room or the language gets uh, out of line and uh, intercede in that dialogue <laughs> and uh, try to summarize, test understanding and summarize what I've been hearing and I tell the client, well, you know, the project steering team, they get to reverse anything. If they decide that, you know, three exercises or five exercises are too much, it's a business decision and they get to make that decision and then they live with the consequences because if my project steering team is composed of stakeholders, then they want what's best for them and they're part of the business and they would prefer to have people 
better prepared to do the job than out there fumbling and stumbling around on high risk, high reward performance, high stakes performance. Normally, guy is not brought in for low hanging fruit on content that could be generated by just about anybody. Normally when I'm brought in, I'm dealing with performance of consequence, performance that has potential impact. And so my training, my instruction has to have that impact and bring people up to speed as quickly as possible, uh, as reasonably as possible. Um, and so the, that you know the question about how many application exercises do we need do we need a demonstration or not given the target audience and do they would that help them if we give them a bunch of information can we put them into the application exercise or should we put this demonstration in there something that I sometimes call a slow mo demo because the hand is quicker than the eye and most performance goes too quickly for people to actually see it, understand the nuances, understand what's tricky, and we can use augmented reality and those kinds of things on videos to help people see what's going on. We can slow the video down, we can label it so that people can, we can point to them and tell them, hey, watch what's going to happen next. And sometimes that's necessary for people to see something that's nuanced. Or if, if we're going, be, and we always have to go beyond the overt physical behaviors of people, to the covert cognitive behaviors of people and so sometimes our demonstration has people thinking out loud like working out loud uh, thinking out loud so that the people observing the demonstration go oh that's how you made that decision oh there was a decision to be made in the first place maybe that's not obvious in terms of how uh, the performers are to be making discriminations, to be making decisions as they do their performance. And of course, that's very necessary to help prepare people to go out there into the real world and to perform as best they can. Again, especially in high stakes performance. Um, so then we sort out the information. We decide, okay, which yellow box goes first, second, third, fourth. Maybe there is a logic to it. Maybe there isn't any logic to any sequence and it could be in any order. Sometimes it's like that. And that allows us to take the analysis data and form a lesson map of instructional activities. So all the boxes that you see in the information column, the demonstration column, and the application column, those are instructional activities and that's another level of design and I'm going to go into that in a subsequent video in this series but that, so that's beyond what we're going to cover today. Um, wrapping up here I've got uh, I've written about this in my 1999 book Lean ISD I've got newsletter articles and uh, from the past from the uh, 80s and 90s uh, from the 90s actually and the early 2000s uh, before 2007 and I went from a, doing a quarterly newsletter to doing a blog so you can find my blog uh, uh, with many many posts on all of this I've done videos on this that are out on YouTube you can find all that links to all that stuff on my website and in my blogs um, but then I took uh, Lean ISD and several other books and created my own book six pack I've joked about this before when I told Bob Mager about this that I have a six pack too. And he said, Oh, good luck with that. Um, he's a very nice guy. Um, that, and so those are references. So the Lean ISD book is 410 pages. I've made it available as a free PDF. You can also get it as a Kindle. The formatting is a little bit different, a little bit better, I think. Um, and you can also order it as a paperback. So you can spend $15 as a paperback or you can get yourself a binder and tabs or whatever you want to use and then print out 410 pages, one-sided, two-sided, whatever you want. And uh, my goal here was to share this approach to performance-based instruction, performance-based training and development, as I like to call it, uh, and to help others climb that learning curve, climb that performance curve, and address the needs of their clients at a level of performance, tasks and outputs and the measures for both, and not just addressing their clients' needs with a series of topics, which is something I've seen too often for way too long, going back to 1979 when I entered the field. That concludes another video in my series, Adventures in Performance-Based Training and Development, with your host, me, Guy Wallace, 
and of course I've subtitled this series The Insomnia Solution. But not for my insomnia, but for yours. I'm just kidding. Cheers.